lot better, thanks. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you briefly um, this morning was about the, the main ways that we can look at helping to tackle the rising cost of energy. Um, and then really uh, some, some tips and things that we can, can all be doing. Uh, and then a bit about our service and how people can access the service and onward support. And I thought I'd sort of um, we'd, we'd cover some of it. So before I bring my slides up, um, what I just wanted to say is that for, for us as a, an organization at, at Thinking Works, we, we basically see that there's only really three ways that you can you can tackle your your high bills. Um, you can look at maximizing your income and others. I think we'll talk more about this um, in other in other sessions. Um, then you need to be able to improve the, the heat retention in a property to keep the heat in. And then we need to look at what we can do to just lower our general energy use. And, the, and so it's the last two that I'm, I really want to, to concentrate on today to uh, to look and see how we can keep more uh, heat in the home and what we can do to uh, change some, uh, some of our uh, behaviours to save energy as well. So what I'm going to try and do here now is on the share screen, let's see if this will work. If I put this up here and do share and do slideshow, if it will allow me to do it. Let me see. So hopefully everyone can see this come up with a slide on increasing heat retention. And so really what, what this is about is that your, your home that you're in is much like your, your person. When it's a cold day, what do you do? You put on a coat. If you're me, you definitely put on a hat. You're probably wearing some gloves as well. And you're trying to, and that basically keeps more heat in. And this is what we want to do with our homes as well. So to increase heat retention, the key way of doing this is that at the moment there is a grant, although it, it may not be open for that much longer. So it's important that we get as many applications in as we can and as soon as we can. And it's called Warmer Homes. Uh, it's paid for by the Greater London Authority and uh, it can be anywhere up to sort of £10,000 and in some cases more for improving wall insulation, loft insulation, floor insulation. All of these things which very much uh, is the same as imagine that loft insulation is like a hat, the difference that it that it can make and wall insulation like a coat. So uh, and these things that to, to um, apply for that grant, you do need to be either in your own home or privately renting, although a landlord does have to top it up. You need a low income uh, or to receive a qualifying benefit as well. And the property has to have a poor energy rating. But we can do all of that assessment for you. So if you feel that your home is cold and drafty, as long as it isn't a housing association home, then uh, we can come and uh, and assess you and see if there's any support through that. There of course are also things that we can just do today because the Warmer Homes Grant it isn't the quickest process in the land. If you apply today, it will be months before you would see any measures installed. It's cold right now, so what can we do? And these are things, some of these measures are things that we can uh, do at home or we can uh, get support from, from friends, family, carers and things to do some of these smaller measures. And, and these are things like um, checking for drafts around windows and things like that. Um, but there are some that also that uh, we can come and fit and we can also refer to Merton's Handy Person Service to also fit as well. And there are things uh, on this slide at the end, there's some silver foil going behind a radiator uh, and that's a radiator reflector panel. And what that's doing is the radiator reflects heat in all directions outside the, the radiator and that um, foil there helps reflect some of the heat back into the room and saves some energy and money. So these are some things that we can do to try and keep more heat in. But one of the main things that we can do that's quite uh, sort of something that we can uh, immediately try and do is to look at things in the home that are using a lot of energy and to then see if there's any way that we can use them in less. I should say that everything in this next section, it really does depend on personal circumstance. Um, the, the key thing is, is to make, make sure that what you're doing is healthy. And so there may be people with different long-term health conditions that are affected by the cold. And so some of this shouldn't apply to you. So, and, and with all of this is very much a process of, of experimentation. So you can try things and then if they're not working, you can, you can change them. But it is all about how we can sort of reduce our energy in a safe and healthy way. The, the first thing really to uh, understand when we look at this is although we can look at everything, there are things that save more energy than others. So for instance, we, we get calls uh, every day asking whether or not we should uh, unplug all of the plugs at the wall at the end of the day because 
is, is that not using a, a lot of energy? And the reality is it's using a small amount of energy. If you went round your entire home and unplugged everything at the wall, you might save 10 or 20 pounds a year. Whereas some of the other things you can do if you cut down on things that get, get hot uh, can save you that in a week or a month. So it's, uh, it's really trying to look and see wh where the, the big wins are. And that's why I've got this slide up here, because it's to show you the difference between something that just has a motor in it and something that gets hot. Especially in the summer, we got a lot of calls saying, well, should I use a fan? Fans surely going to use a lot of energy. Um, what should we be doing with that? But if we look here, fan, 50 watts of energy. Don't worry too much about what that, that actually means, because it's more the comparative part that I really, really want to crystallize. And that's because the fan is 50 watts. Just got a motor making that fan go round. The fan heater, which is just a fan with a heating element, goes from 50 watts to 2,000 watts. This is an enormous leap up. So as soon as you add a heating element to something, it then really, really, really starts using the energy. So where do we need to look at then? Where are the key areas that we can target? So the first one is, is in heating. And again, saying that not for everybody, we can't in all cases have the heating on. I don't have the heating on at the moment. I've got a trusty hot water bottle sitting on my lap to keep me nice and warm during this presentation. But that's okay for me. I don't have any long-term conditions. So it's again, it's about experimentation, but what can we do with that? So I've got my hot water bottle. I'm wearing a number of layers. I've got three different jumpers on, on top. Uh, there, there are a couple of thin ones underneath because it keeps the heat in. And this allows me to keep the heating on. The average cost for heating at the moment can be up to a pound an hour. So when you're looking at that, any hour or two that you can cut off with the heating and replace that with either things like layers or hot water bottle is making really, really large savings. So it's worth considering how you can do that as long as it can be done in a healthy and safe way. The, the next one is, is in washing. So we're all going to be washing our, our clothes and, and how do we uh, get them dry in a, in a cheaper way? So with this, the key thing, and again, it's back to that, that spinning of a, of a motor. At the end of your wash, if you do an extra spin cycle, it costs very, very little money. There's no heating element in that spinning cycle, but it does get a lot of the water out of your clothes, which means they dry quicker, which means it's much cheaper depending on your, on your drying method. The average tumble dryer is 2000 watts, just like that fan heater we saw. So it's a big, big energy user. So if you do have a tumble dryer and you can cut down the time that something is in that tumble dryer, even if it's only by a few minutes, the, collectively this does save a lot of money. So even what I do with this is that I, I do my extra spins in half loads. And the reason I do that is, is because if you've got more space in the drum as it's going round, then it gets more moisture out because the clothes are dashing around tumbling around inside that drum and it gets more moisture out. Um, I do have a drying rack, which is this um, a middle picture, um, which is a rack with a, with a plug. Um, and it's okay. What it really does is, is it just does that last bit of heating on clothes. If it's been cold, there's been no sun, um, then it, it can take the little a bit of moisture out. But it's mostly, I have four other drying racks that I move around and I basically follow the sun. I'm in a little mid terrace house where the sun goes at the front in the morning at the back in the afternoon and I'll, I'll move things around when there is sun unlike today but it's uh, any way that you can cut down on uh, drying time in a tumble dryer there's big savings to be made cooking as well there's been a lot of talk about air fryers the the the, the magical air fryer um and i think it's important to explain how the maths works on it and where they're good and where they're not so an average oven is 2000 watts much like your tumble dryer, much like the, um, the small fan heater. Now, an oven's a big space. It's a huge space, really, when you think about what you can get in there. Um, you know, people put like whole chickens, turkeys, things like that. But the average oven in its daily use has nothing like that in it. Uh, I, I have a daughter, and I'm guilty in the past of putting three fish fingers in a 2,000 watt oven. Now, that is a very, very expensive way of cooking your fish fingers. This is where the air fryer is good. So the average oven, 2,000 watts, the average air fryer is 1,000 or less, so it's half, but it is much smaller. Even if you look at this picture, they've had to cram the French fries in there to do them. So it's good if you only need to use it once, but if, for instance, you're cooking for a large family, this is where an air fryer isn't so good because you might have to use it several times to actually cook your dinner. Air fryers are brilliant for one or two people. 
absolutely fantastic because there's a much smaller cooking area. They can cook faster and use uh, less energy, but they, they come into their own essentially when you're not cooking very much. Um, also microwave slow cookers are fantastic ways to, to save. Another key one is in, is in bathing. The average bath is 80 liters of water. Now, anyone who has boiled any water in a pan uh, on a gas hob and has waited and waited and waited for that water to heat up. That's something to keep in your mind when you think about just how much energy and cost it is to get 80 liters of water, a full bath, nice and warm. It's not cheap. Put this in context, when I was renting before, I had a, an electric shower, it's called the Triton 9000. I use 9000 watts. So we've got an oven, 2000 watts. So this is more than four times the energy of an oven to heat the shower because of that. That's what it requires to get that intense heat super quick. And whether or not you've got an electric shower or not, it's important to understand that heating the water for bathing is expensive. So when you're looking at ways to save, do you need the bath to be full? Can you take 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters off the depth of that bath? Anything you can take off has really, really large savings because you're putting a lot of energy in there to, to heat that. Again, cutting down on the time you're in the shower also has significant savings because of the cost. If there is, if you are looking to make an investment, um, probably the quickest payback period you're gonna get is on LED lighting. It can be up to 10 times less energy. So for instance, um, in spotlights, a friend of mine had a, a new kitchen in and the, uh, they had 10 50 watt halogen lights. Come on, that's 500 watts of, light, of, of, of energy being used for these lights. Those 50 watt um, halogen bulbs can be replaced for five watt ones and they'll give off the same amount of light. And effectively you will notice no difference except it might be cooler in the summer and a more bearable place to be. But they're, they're now very affordable when you get them from the supermarket and other places. Um, and we can give people a, a couple of, uh, of LEDs as well um, when we come and see them. And I'll come on to uh, that in a, in a second. Uh, the last one is that the caveat to things getting hot and being the most expensive thing is that it's also the same if you're looking at really major cooling. It's not like a fan. A fan is just a, a motor. But if you're looking at air conditioning, you're looking at fridges, you're looking at freezers, these are things that do cost money to run because they're essentially drawing the heat out to make things very cold. How do you get, uh, well, I should first of all say that your fridge and freezer is not on all the time. It's got a thermostat on it. And the way that they work is, is that you've set your fridge and freezer to be a, a steady cold temperature. The fridge and freezer only comes on and calls for energy when the temperature rises above that. So it's getting warmer. So the, so the key thing is, is how do we get your fridge and freezers to stay cold for longer? Now, keeping air cool, it's not a great medium, but if you actually have uh, something that's solid in there, it's much, much better at retaining the cold. So if your fridge and freezer isn't full, you want to, to fill it, particularly your freezer. If there's any gaps in there, you want to fill them. And you can fill them with, for instance, a plastic bottle full of water. That water freezes and becomes a block of ice. It then retains that cold really, really, really well. And it means the thermostat comes on less. So if you have, uh, empty um, freezer, you can put um, bottles of water in there, you can put uh, an emergency loaf of bread, anything in there that could be that, that can uh, keep that, that cold as a solid, as ice will mean that your, uh, your thermostat comes on less. So that very much is a whistle-stop tour of some key areas that, that we can all really look at to, to make some significant savings in our home. But also it's important to know what we do as a service and how we can come and help you. So um, our fuel poverty support service has several stages to it. And we've had to split it um, because demand has been an all time high. We've been running we're in our 11th year and I've never known demand for energy support uh, like we have at the moment. So the stage one is, is crisis support. We have fuel vouchers. So if you've got a, a prepay meter, um, we can give you £49 to put on that prepay meter uh, as some uh, crisis money to keep things going. Um, we've got emergency heating repairs and emergency electric heating. So if your heating system breaks down, we can get an emergency electric heater to you. It's often on overnight delivery uh, from Screwfix or Tool Station, but we'll get one to you and an oil heater where possible. Um, and we work with uh, two heating engineer firms locally that uh, can come out to look and see if we can do an emergency heating repair to get your heating up and running. Um, all three of these have been an enormous demand and 
as we've been speaking now, I've seen popping up more requests for fuel vouchers. So it's uh, uh, been, been an important thing. We action that essentially immediately and everything gets dropped to do the crisis support. But what that does do is it pushes back and delays our standard support, which is that, um, what we want to do is, is that we realize that this crisis support, it supports out the crisis. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't look long term about how you can save energy and, and do those things we've been talking about earlier. So the, the medium term support um, involves three small measures and it includes a couple of LED lights, radiator reflector panels that, that we can get fitted. There's also a free carbon monoxide detector as well. It won't save you any money, but it's a good thing for, um, for safety so, so that we can do that. Uh, we give room by room advice on lowering the, the heating bills. Much of what I've just covered is just uh, one of the team either talking to you about that over the phone or, or in the home, looking at how you uh, uh, actually use uh, use energy. As you can imagine, things are very different. If you're in a, a one bed flat uh, or a five bed house, your energy demand is very different. So we tailor the advice depending on um, your circumstances. We give advice on where there are uh, tariff discounts. So for instance, um, Thames Water and Sutton and East Slurry Water, um, parts of the borough use either of the water suppliers, you get a 50% discount on your water if you have an income under £20,111. Um, it's a very exact figure, but um, what we can do is we have the forms here and our team can help you complete those if you've got that, that low income to make sure that you're paying half for your water. We do the assessments for the Warmer Homes Grant and we make referrals uh, for uh, other support services, whether it be Wimbledon Guild, um, Age UK, or through our, our Energy Max program uh, with Citizens Advice uh, in Sutton, where we can help uh, with, uh, with their cases as well. Um, and we also make referrals to the London Fire Brigade uh, for free uh, smoke alarms. Then really the long-term uh, support and the ongoing stage is support through this grants process because it isn't quick. So we, we start off doing the assessment, finding that somebody is eligible, and then we have a specific grants team that's a separate uh, a team that will call and that you've got a point of contact that can help you through all of that process if an application is in. They can talk you through technologies like uh, external wall insulation, uh, underfloor insulation or anything like that. So we've got a, a, a sort of from application process to install uh, hand-holding uh, service there. So then uh, who's eligible for the service? So anyone who is 65 years old or over um, or has a long-term condition of disability or has a low income. That varies on, on homes, but in general, uh, if, you, if you're receiving a benefit like universal credit uh, or just a pension, then, then, uh, uh, then you'd be, be eligible for it. Also, if a service refers um, you to us, so for instance, if uh, MenCap were to refer you to us, we would uh, be able to see you because we realised that frontline teams uh, are aware of where there's need and we'd never turn anybody down um, when, where, where need exists. And so then so how to access the service. Um, and uh, I'm, I'll make sure these slides are, are shared around uh, as well. So you've got these, but we've got uh, a free phone number, uh, the, the 0800 number. We have a text phone that you can just send a text on. And we've got email as well at inquiries at thinkingworks.co.uk. Um, basically, we don't have a referral form. We just need your, your name, address and postcode and a contact number and a brief reason of why you can support. And then we'll contact you uh, with the support that's, uh, that, that's needed. So um, that's uh, everything from, uh, uh, from me and my presentation. Fabulous. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Olivia. I'm the Warm and Well Immersing Project Manager on behalf of Wimbledon Guild. So we work very closely with Thinking Work. So I'll try not to duplicate any information because Giles was extremely comprehensive, but um, I'll give you a brief overview of the project and let you know what we do. Lovely, thank you. So Warm and Well is a council funded initiative and it is in partnership with Merton Council, Age UK Merton and Thinking Works. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about what everybody does. And we are currently funded until March 2023. So hopefully we will be getting funding again for another year. But we will see. So we are, you know, the initial programme was set up to look into reducing winter related illnesses and hospital admissions and how to stay important and healthy all year round. Thank you. 
So HUK and Mornington Guild provide free confidential telephone advice and they can do a personal assessment to look into any pensions, benefits, anything that you could be eligible for that you that you are not receiving and they can help you apply for that as well. And we also have financial support for individuals at Wimbledon Guild, but my colleague Vanessa will go into that, so I will leave that to her. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. So the information on staying well in colder weather, we do a lot of outreach and we do a lot of talks to community groups as well. So we do tips on how to stay warm and well and information on local services. We do have A4 information books that we do give out when giving talks. So I should probably arrange a delivery for those, but I will also be sending Tracy all the information that I go over in this, in this PowerPoint. So the Handy Person Service here is employed by Merton Council and it's for Merton residents only that are aged over 65 or have a long-term health condition. So it's not a means tested service. The only thing you do have to do is pay for the materials, but the labour is completely free. There is not a limit on how many times a year you can have him, but it is worth noting he doesn't do decorating or gardening. And he basically does everything that doesn't require a professional or a tradesman. So you can fit light bulbs, smoke alarm batteries, toilet seats, taps, things like that. Any questions, please do give me a call. My information is at the end that I will go into. Next slide, please. Fantastic. So similar to what Giles was saying, we do have a top tips file that we give out to individuals. I will send this to Tracy as well, but it's tips and tricks to save money around the house. And it will also tell you roughly how much you are saving. So it is worth having a look at this. I won't go over it now because Giles did cover quite a lot of them, but it is worth noting that I will be sending this out. Thank you. So getting your home winter ready, I understand we're already in January, but it is worth noting these. So make sure that you are getting your heating system serviced each year. Um, claim all the financial support you can with helping your bills. Make sure you're getting the rebates as well. Any questions about that, please do speak to either myself or we can have a chat with CAB. Make sure you have a carbon monoxide alarm in each room that has a gas source. So please do ensure that you are doing that and test regularly. Make sure the battery is working. And also the same with the smoke alarm. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So these are the main questions that I ask when I do go out and across the borough. So do you know where your main stock stock is? If you don't, please do have a look because water pipes can freeze, particularly in the colder weather that we had. So please do have a look. And consider fitting a grab rail if you have steps at the front or back door, if it's a slippery surface, if the person that you are caring for is prone to falls, please do have a look at that. And also salt and sand is very handy to have on hand when, you know, it's very slippery, it's frosty, you've got black eyes, so please do also think about that. Next slide, please. Thank you. So looking after your health is more important now than ever, especially in the cold weather that we've had. Make sure you are getting your COVID-19 boosters as well as your flu jabs. Consider taking supplements. Do have a chat with your GP about this first. And good hand hygiene as well, especially since, you know, since COVID, we've had flu this year that they've branded super flu. It's very worth just washing your hands a little bit more often. Thank you. So exposure to cold for a long time or extreme cold can increase your blood pressure, which means you could be at risk of a heart attack or stroke. So please do ensure that the individuals you are caring for remain warm. And I'll give you tips on how to do that. Staying active as well. This is very important. I understand some people are a little bit less mobile than others, but there are seated exercises that are fantastic. And there is a link here. And eating well at least one hot meal a day. Hot drinks during the day is a great way to keep hydrated if the individual is maybe struggling with water intake and make sure you are obviously getting your five a day. Next slide, please. Smoking as well, this is worth having a look into. Please do, if you can, look into quitting, look into weaning yourself off. Personal alarms as well for individuals that don't have living carers or if they're on their own for a few hours a day. Mascot telecare is a fantastic resource. So please do have a look into that. And that will also be on the local information form that I sent to Tracy. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
So five ways to wellbeing. So connect, ensure that the individual you are caring for is well socialised. Be active, as mentioned, sitting exercises are a great one. Take notice, a bit of mindfulness can actually go quite a long way. And keep learning, reading, writing, having a look at different documentaries. That's a good one. Next slide, please. Thank you. So keeping warm indoors. So low temperatures increase the risk of flu, high blood pressure. So the optimal temperature for a bedroom should be 18 degrees and your living room should be 21 degrees. Use a blanket and prop your feet up as the air is colder at ground level. We'll wear warm clothes in bed, maybe bed hats as well. I know nobody tends to wear them these days, but you do lose the vast majority of your body heat through your head. And use a hot water bottle or an electric blanket, but never both at the same time. And of course, make sure the bedroom window is kept shut overnight. And as Giles mentioned, maybe look into some thermal curtains. Now, keeping warm outdoors, make sure your hands are warm, a hat, a scarf and some gloves. Wrap your scarf around your face to keep the warm air in. Several thin layers are much better than one thick layer because you are, you, you're giving it a trap for the air, the warm air. Because actually, although you've got one big jumper on, you actually lose quite a lot of that heat through the clothing. And keep your feet warm. They say this is the regular, the regulator of body temperature. It's very true. Make sure you've got thermal socks on, boots and things like that. And always check the local news and weather before heading out. So myth busting, a lot of people say wearing a hat is enough. I've heard this one quite a lot. But of course, as well as a hat, although you do lose most of your heat through your head, as I said, a scarf around the mouth is much better because it will protect you. And breathing in cold air does increase the risk of chest infections and increases blood pressure. Keeping the heating on for a couple of hours will work. But if you can keep your house at a, at a stable temperature, of course, we can't have the heating on all day, but maybe have a look at, you know, thermal curtains and draft excluders and things like that. And the benefits of insulation, yes, people seem to think that this is only a winter thing. Of course, you're keeping the heat in, but actually at the same time during the, the warmer months, you will feel benefits all year round because you will be keeping the heat out as well. I don't think this is gonna work, so let's go to the next slide, please. Wonderful. So this is the general inquiry line. So 0208-946-0735 is Wilmington Guild's main switchboard. My email is there as well, or alternatively, you can visit warmandwellwithmerton.co.uk. And HUK's number is on the left here, and this is benefits advice. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me. I've just actually put together a few images which will help give you an idea of what the community fridge is and, and how it works. So um, first of all, in a, in a nutshell, this is sort of a team of volunteers and myself uh, and a bit of the setup. So the community fridge, the theory behind it is it's really a food waste project, but the beauty of it is, uh, is that it's a, it, it, it sort of solves one problem with another. So there's an awful lot of food gets thrown away in, in this country and around the world. In fact, globally, a third of all food produced actually goes to waste, which is just shocking. Um, and in this country, 70% uh, of all of the food that goes to waste is actually in our households. Um, but that's a sort of education piece, whereas what we do is we save food that's going to get thrown away um, from shops and restaurants. So it's all still good, um, fine to eat, totally safe, but just uh, passport they, how they want to sell it so yes you might find a carrot with a with a, a black spot on it or or a slightly strangely shaped something but um totally fine to eat um and as well as bread bread is produced in vast quantities in this country it's inexpensive to produce um and retailers bakeries don't want to sell it um the next day excuse me sorry um and so therefore it usually gets thrown away or, or sent for um, maybe uh, making into biofuel or even fed to animals, um, but actually it's perfectly good to eat. So what we do is we've got a team of volunteers who travel around the borough um, throughout the week, picking up food from shops, uh, supermarkets, bakeries, uh, some restaurants as well, uh, bringing it back to our community fridge, which is based at Morden Baptist Church um, 
which is right in the centre of Morden, actually sort of opposite the civic centre. Um, we store the food, some of it we freeze, some goes in the fridge, some goes in sealed boxes, and then we're open three days a week um, to distribute to anybody who wants or needs it. So this is a, a good example of the food coming in. So we collect from local co-ops, we recruit child labour, <laughs> although only if an adult present. Um, I think this, this chap was actually there with his mum doing some volunteering for his Duke of Edinburgh. Um, we bring all the food in, store it safely, um, as I said, and that involves fruit and veg, bakery products, all sorts. We do get some long life stuff. Uh, supermarkets where the outer packaging, let's say a box of cereal, where the cardboard bits slightly damaged, they don't want to be, they can't sell it. We can take it because the inner packaging is still intact so uh, we'll only give out food that's safe to eat um but it just might not look like it did when it came, first came out of the factory um so yeah so we're open three days a week um monday wednesday and thursday monday is 4 30 to 5 30 wednesday is 4 30 to 5 30 and thursday is 1 30 to 2 30. now you don't have to have a voucher to, to come to see us. You don't have to qualify in any way. Um, you know, for us, the people who come and visit the fridge uh, are doing us a favor as well because they're helping save this food from going to waste. So we, what happens, you arrive at the time that we, or five minutes before the start time, then we'll open the door. We don't have a queuing system. We don't want people to stand outside in the cold for hours before because um, it's not fair for some people who can't stand. Uh, and also we just like to keep it more friendly and, um, and therefore we'll open the door, everyone sits down and we'll give you a random number. It's a lottery. One day you might get number one, next day you might get number 40, uh, but it's random. So the idea is you're not, you're not stood waiting. Um, and this is a this picture is uh, as our lovely volunteers from Morden Hall Park. They work in the kitchen garden in the growing season, which it has to say, be said is not now. Um, we get lots of donations of lovely fresh food in from different allotments and growing projects around the borough as well. So really, throughout the spring, summer, autumn, the fresh produce we get is brilliant. So we're handing out really good, healthy food, which is is what we want to be doing. That said, we do get a lot of bakery products too, so um, and all sorts. You never know. For example, today on my way in, I picked up about a hundred jars of mincemeat. The little can't sell, and they've decided Christmas is over finally. So you know, if you pop along to our community fridge at lunchtime today, uh, yeah, it'll be Christmas all over again. Um, so yes, we are. Um, we're run by volunteers almost entirely. I, as myself, I work for Sustainable Merton. Um, I have a colleague who also helps coordinate the operations at the fridge. But everybody else is volunteers. We have a team of about fifty. Um, a lot of our volunteers have come from visiting the fridge to collect food to come and join us in helping to run it um, because it's a really fun, friendly environment. Super rewarding. Um, also, those who volunteer for us, if they if they would like to collect a food parcel, they can do that before we open our doors because otherwise uh, everything will be gone because each shift we make sure we get rid of all of our food because um, a lot of it's towards the end of its um, use by use by or uh, or just general life. So we want to get get it shifted so that we've got space for the new stuff to come in. Um, yes, yeah, so the no queuing is important. Also, if you come along. Please, please, please bring a bag or two bags, really. Um, we don't issue plastic bags. We don't like plastic bags. We try and move away from packaging like that. Um, but uh, so we do ask that everyone brings a bag with them. Um, so the way the way your visit would look like is you turn up at the door five minutes before, not an hour before. We'll open the door. You come in and sit down. We'll give you a random number. If it's the first time you visited, someone will come and take some basic details and give you a membership card. Um, that's just got a three digit number um, that you bring each time you come to the fridge and we just take down that number just so we have an idea of um, who's visiting and, and on the initial form we'll ask you you know your postcode and how many people are in your household real basic bits of info but just so we know how many people are um, coming through the door and, and, and we're sort of servicing if you like. Um, so on to volunteers another really good thing to do is to come and volunteer with us because like I say it's being part of a really fun team this is our Wednesday morning team who receive in a lot of deliveries. We sort out all the fruit and veg, we store it away properly, uh, make a plan for what's going to be going out the next day. And also we divvy up some food that's going to be cooked on a Wednesday because as well as um, as well as handing out our, our food, the, our surplus food on a Wednesday at the community fridge at 4.30, we also cook with the 
with the surplus and from 4.30 till 6, there's warm food available at the community fridge at the church as well. And the really nice thing about, about that is it's a real social fun environment. The church has put on kids activities, there's sort of a pool table and air hockey. Um, people sit and eat with each other and make conversation and socialise. Um, when they've only known each other before from just sitting waiting to come and collect the food. Now it's actually a bit of a social occasion, plus it's a warm space, um, which I can tell you sitting here in my office in Morden Hall Park is a very welcome thing on a Wednesday. Um, so that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, you can go to our website, sustainablemerton.org forward slash community fridge, and that gives you all the information about when we're open. Um, we also try to theme our wet, what we call our warm Wednesdays where the food offering the hot food offering is um so i'm hoping i think i have in march at the beginning of march that got lined up a um a chef who was on the recent series of master chef who lives vaguely locally um so we always try to theme it um, and get people involved and you know just provide really good quality food but again cooking with the surplus um so that's it in a nutshell i don't think there's a huge amount more i need to tell you hi everybody um I'm Vanessa from the Wimbledon Guild and I run our welfare grant service. Um, so today I just wanted to sort of run through a little bit with you um, what sort of financial help is available to Merton residents through, uh, through the grant service at the Wimbledon Guild. Um, we've got a, a pot of money from the Household Support Fund, which um, I know uh, Giles mentioned when he was speaking earlier. And we we're sort of open to try and getting that out to as many um, qualifying Merton residents as we can. Um, so we have a, a grant service with sort of three different kinds of um, financial support available. Um, and I'm just going to quickly run through those today with you. Um, and then obviously any questions um, can be asked at the end or um, by email, I'll provide my email. Um, as well for anyone who wants to ask any specific questions. Um, the thing to mention I think before I start is what I will run through is general guidance. What I want to make really clear is we really make our assessments on an individual basis. So if you've got a particular question about your particular situation, um, don't discount yourself from being eligible. Do speak to us um, first and we can sort of run through things with you and look at your look at your case um, on a on a on an individual basis. So I'll start with the, the small grants. Um, that's a, a bit of a historical name. They're not tiny amounts that we give out. They're normally between about 100 and 500 pounds. And it's for things that you need for your home. So it'll be things like if you need a new mattress um, or you need um, a, a new appliance, if you know washing machines broken down and you're struggling to replace it, we might be able to buy that for you. Um, also, we do a lot of help with school uniforms, um, work clothes, if people need uh, specific work where we can look at that as well. So there's all kinds of things we cover. Um, we've, we've, um, we've paid for people to get a DBS check to get into work. So we're, we're very flexible. Um, if you've got something that we haven't covered before, please contact us um, and we will look at it to see if it's something we consider um, covering for you. Um, the way to apply for this, we have an application form. It's not massively long, but um, we can help you fill that out. Or if you're um, working with um, Yvonne or Carolyn or Tracy at, at, at MenCap, they can normally help you with that as well and give you some guidance. They've been through the process before um, with some of their, their clients. Um, so it's a, an application form, takes your basic details and just a little bit more about you and about why you need help. Accompanying that, we do ask for some financial information. Um, so that's a bank statement of one month um, as, a, as a minimum. And that's really to look at um, what your financial situation is. It'll give us an idea of whether you're receiving the right sort of benefit if, you, if your income is from benefits. Um, and if not, to be able to refer you to other organisations that might be able to help you um, maximise your income. Um, so that's for sort of larger items and you can apply for more than one item at a time. So um, I was working with somebody yesterday who's just moved into a, a new flat and he and his family needed 
basically everything. So we looked at what things we could um, supply, like uh, the beds, the table and chairs, uh, and a wardrobe. And then we helped him to look at other organisations that might be able to um, make up the, the sort of shortfall in what we could supply. So somebody to maybe buy a washing machine, someone else to um, find a fridge freezer, that sort of thing. Um, so if you think what you need is more than we might be able to, to provide, still get in touch and we, we can sometimes help you look at uh, more broadly what other um, grants or help is available. Um, the second type of grant we offer is cash grants and that's exactly what it said. It's a small cash sum to fill in a gap, maybe um, a benefit payments been delayed or perhaps um, a payment that you've received has coincided with a big bill going out um, that you weren't expecting and you find yourself short. So again, if you send through a bank statement um, to us as proof of finances, we can look at um, paying a certain amount of money depending on what it is you need. So the minimum we would pay out would be £50. That's for um, uh, an adult on their own, but we can pay up to um, about £100 in cash for those. Um, we do issue them remotely, so you don't need to um, come into the office for those, although that is a possibility if that's preferred. Um, we try and issue cash remotely via, um, via an automated system sent by a text message, um, which obviously we explain um, at the time of issuing the cash, so hopefully it won't be too confusing. Uh, the last thing which has really come into its own um, with the Household Support Fund is paying bills. So one of the things we've been helping with uh, the last few months is paying bills. We've all seen our bills, particularly fuel bills, going up and up, um, and it can be quite difficult to know how we're going to cover those. Um, we do have funds available to help you pay bills. Um, we will help you to look at um, other support available. So I know um, Giles mentioned some of the um, uh, some of the funds available to help with uh, fuel bills, um, the British Gas Energy Trust, and uh, the fifty percent off your water bill if you earn under uh, if your income's under twenty thousand pounds. So those things we'll look at as well. But if you um, are able to fill in our application form with your bank statement and also send us a copy of the bill you would like us to look at covering. We can very often um, we can very often cover that for you, and that's for people who have um, are paying by direct debit, maybe getting a quarterly or monthly bill. If you are topping up on a key or card meter, we will normally make a referral to Giles and his team at Thinking Works to issue fuel vouchers for that. Um, that's so that's a sort of whistle stop summary of the grant service. I'm sorry it's not the most exciting. Um, um, information I haven't got any lovely pictures like um, like Jude um, but what what I would just reiterate is if you're struggling financially um, it very often we can help just give us a call or speak to your um, whoever your contact is at at Mencap um, and see whether it whether there are things that we can help you with um, financially and as I said if it's something we might not be able to help you with we very often can signpost to other organizations who who can help I think that's all that I need to say at the moment I did though just want to take this opportunity just to run through some of the support um, at Citizens of Ice, Merton and Lambeth um, that we can offer um, and just a little bit of general information on debt. Um, oh, if I can have the next slide, please, that would be great. So there's many, many reasons why people can get into debt. Um, and quite often it only becomes a problem when the debt becomes unmanageable. So reasons that you may, we may typically be seeing clients um, having is a reduction in their income. Um, it may be higher living cost as we've heard today. We know how expensive everything is getting bills are getting expensive. We only have to go to the supermarkets to see that um, groceries have increased by such a huge margin. And if we haven't got extra income coming in, 
then it's going to be far, far less money to pay credit cards, pay, pay mortgages. Um, and these are all reasons why we are seeing more and more people getting into debts. Again, unexpected, unexpected expenditure for any of us who have got cars or pets. We know that certainly it's really virtually impossible to plan for the clutch to go, for example, um, or pets to get ill, job losses, reduction in hours. More and more we're seeing clients coming in on zero hour contracts. So it's really difficult for them just to be able to budget to know in advance just exactly what income they have coming in. Relationship breakdowns. Um, if someone is left um, on their own, perhaps they haven't got their partner's income coming in, they've got children, there can be so many different reasons why that relationship breakdown can really cause so many problems. Quite often what we see is that one partner deals with all the finances. If they then leave, that the person that's left perhaps has not got to any idea or exactly what bills they should be paying. Um, we keep hearing in the news things like rising mortgage um, cost, rising um, rent increases because the landlord has got mortgage um, costs to pay. And all of these can indeed make it that debt um, can really accrue health conditions, um, people suddenly not being able to work, people being on statutory sick pay instead of being on their full salary, again, is another reason why debt can become from being manageable to becoming such a major problem in such short periods. Can I have the next slide, please? So we um, really do recognise at Citizens Advice, Merson and Lambeth, um, how important it is that people do get advice on debt at the very, very possible um, stage. So, for example, if someone were to come into one of our drop-in sessions um, or to call up our, our advice line, even if it is about a non-related issue, perhaps someone has had their claim for personal independence turned down, we would always ask questions about whether um, the client has got any debts, because particularly at the moment, we are seeing so many people really, really struggling. Um, and I think we know that quite often people do um, want to bury their heads in the sand so that they don't want to always deal um, with the issue. Um, it's really not uncommon for people to come into our Mitcham Morton offices with a carrier bag full of unopened bills because it's at that stage when they're just like, I've got all this post, I'm overwhelmed, I really can't cope. And I think what I really, really do want to stress is we will never judge anyone um, for the debt, the position that they're in, um, and everything is completely confidential um, that you may say to us. Um, also completely impartial, we're not tied to anyone, any organization. Um, so certainly when we are working out things like debt repayments, um, we are able to do it for the client's best interest, not what's going to be best um, for an, another organization that we may be working with. So if you, um, friends, family members do want debt advice, we can be contacted in a number of different ways. We can be contacted via our Merton advice line. And I have popped the telephone number um, on the slides. We can also be accessed face to face in our Mitcham office, um, which is open five days a week, Monday to Friday, between 10 and 3. 
um, and our Morton Mill office is open Monday, Wednesday and Thursdays between 10 and 3. Um, sorry, I should have also said our advice line is open five days a week between 10 and 4. Um, also, from earlier this month, um, we have got some extra funding courtesy of Merton Council um, to do some outreach cost of living um, work. So we are currently basing ourselves in several libraries. Um, we are in Collier's Wood on a Monday, uh, Pollard to Hill on a Friday, sorry, and Wimbledon Library on a Thursday, um, where clients can just pop in, get some information, but if they do require some further advice, can also be booked in with a specialist debt advisor as well. Um, also, people can contact us on an online referral form, which we have got on our website as well. Um, we also do work very closely with Wimbledon Guild. Um, so Vanessa, if Vanessa has got any clients who have applied for grants who would benefit from debt advice, we also have one of our advisors based in Wimbledon Guild once a week as well. So what can we do with clients? Well, first of all, what we will quite often do is place a client in something called breathing space, um, which just give a couple of months um, protection where they're not being um, contacted by their creditors. Um, which, as you can imagine, can be greatly beneficial, um, not only for the, cl um, the client, but also for us as well. Um, whilst we draw up a financial statement, just to see exactly what is manageable. Um, I think quite often what we see is that clients will pay the creditors who are shouting the loudest money um, rather than the, for example, their rents, which there may be far greater circumstance if they were to lose that money. Um, we can also help with um, referring to the diff different um, Merson schemes that have been mentioned in this, um, help with other grant applications that Wimbledon Guild may not be able to provide. We can also look at benefit maximisation. Um, one of the things that as part of debt advice we will always do is see if other um, income is available. Um, so, for example, um, what we may see is that someone is affected by the benefit cap, um, which is something that the government's put in Oh, many more years ago than I would care to think, probably about 10 or 11 years ago, um, which means that the amount of benefits um, that someone can get is very regulated. Um, but if someone is receiving personal independence payment, for example, they will then be taken out of that cap and they will receive considerably more than just that personal independence payment alone. So it is all these things that we will be looking at and not just dealing with the presenting issue. Can we have the next slides? So after looking at the debt issues, um, we can also um, signpost or refer to some of our in-house services. Um, so Merton also fund us for a specialist disability advisor. Um, I'm sure that any of you um, or perhaps your friends or family um, have made claims for personal independence payment, disability living allowance, um, maybe limited uh, capacity for work as part of universal credits, have seen those benefits being rejected. Well, that's certainly something that the disability advisor is able to help with. Um, and that is from the initial application 
to um, dealing with mandatory reconsiderations, appeals, um, and producing submissions. The only thing we don't do is representation. We also, and um, so fortunate to have this because not many local citizens advice do, is have an immigration advisor um, who we um, have got funding from Trust for London, um, who will go up to level two, um, and he can provide advice um, that can really help not only individuals but families as well. Um, so that may be we're still seeing clients needing to apply for the EU settlement scheme, which although they are technically out of time, um, the Home Office are still allowing some out of time applications for genuine reasons. Um, in also, if, for example, clients have got limited leave to remain in the country, quite often can't access benefits, who will be able to see whether um, can work with those individuals just to remove those conditions. We also have got really close links with Duncan Lewis, um, which is a local solicitors company um, who do come in to do some pro bono housing advice for us. Um, particularly important if people are facing evictions um, and we can also refer to shelter as well. Often also we can um, refer to generalist advisors as well. So um, for consumer issues, for example, um, that, that is something that our generalist advisors can do, um, as well as supporting the disability advisor um, for any benefit support as well. The one thing that I would say is that the demand for our service because of cost of living has never been so high. I have worked for Citizens Advice for coming up for 13 years now, and I have never seen the demand for the service being as high as what it currently is. Um, so unfortunately, um, what we are seeing is some weights for our service, but what we always will do is try to meet deadlines and try to make sure that um, clients have got sufficient information um, and advice to be able to at least manage for that waiting period until they can come in and see an accredited advisor. Next slide, please. So I thought it would just be um, helpful just to run through a case study. Um, so, for example, um, we've seen a client in his early 70s living with his wife, sheltered accommodation um, with long term health difficulties. Um, certainly, on the face of it, is, is receiving all the benefits that would be entitled to. Um, but he came in because he was so worried about. Um, credit card debts that he had built up. So what we would do with a case like this is to do a full benefit check to make sure that he definitely was receiving everything that he was entitled to. For example, would there be any pension credits that he was due, um, which may be then affected if there was an occupational pension. So what we would do then is draft a financial statement um, just to have a look at all the options. Um, in this particular case, that we could see that there was a very small um, amount of surplus income and that for him to have repaid that £9,000 credit card debt would have taken so many years. So in this particular case, we did apply for a debt relief order um, which is often regarded as being mini bankruptcy, um, which meant that the £9,000 credit card debt was completely wiped out. Um, and as you can imagine, the relief of not having that debt on his shoulders was absolutely tremendous. Um, and so, so grateful for the amount of supports. 
Next slide, please. So I think it's really um, important to be stressing is that although we are busy, we really would encourage Merton residents to come to us um, or indeed go to um, National Deadline, for example, or another um, organization that Free London providing regulated debt advice. But there are, however, several options that clients can do um, and that you can do to get further information. There's many benefits um, calculators online. Um, I've given an example of one on the screen in Title II, um, which will ask for quite a lot of um, different personal circumstance. So do you have a partner? Do you have any children? Ask for disabilities. And it will then give a general idea about what benefits you may be entitled to. Um, you are also giving um, an example of a budget tool as well. Um, I think quite often what we will see is that particularly for people, um, say on universal credit, who are receiving one payment every four weeks that may have been used to receiving information weekly, that can then really get um, a little bit harder to budget because of having to wait so long between payments. We also um, do see some clients coming in to us who have been to on to turn to us um, and on there there is other information about grants um, that some people may be entitled to as well. Most of those do need to be referred by um, a professional and we then would be able to help with that grant application as well. I think that's the final slide, but I may be, yep. So I was gonna say, please, please feel free to ask me any questions. Hi, um, I, I, I think my name is Carolyn Doyle. And for those who don't know me, I'm, um, I support carers of adults with learning disabilities and or autism. And I'm, I've been with Mencap for a, a, a year now, it's flown. Um, and I work with um, everyone who's spoken today. Um, we're very, very lucky to have such a, an incredible support in the borough, I have to say, in these difficult times. So as I said before, if one message comes through today, please, please um, do reach out um, to the services. Um, and for those of you who aren't so confident, and I, I know who you are, I, I'm slightly one of them myself, who isn't always confident with technology and um, looking up links and, and such, we've become that world now, haven't we? Um, that's one really good thing about our advisory service. Um, we're happy to meet with you face-to-face -face or print documents or help fill in forms. Um, so please don't be put off um, if, if you can't follow links. For those of you who can, you can self-refer sometimes and that's fine. But both Yvonne and myself um, can help you um, navigate um, for referrals for those organisations that need them. Um, we've had loads of information today and it's really difficult times. Um, I just want to say that Yvonne Doors, if those of you don't know her, she's um, my colleague, she's a carer's advisor. Um, she focuses on carer's assessments mainly, um, but she, as well as I, who does, who do, who does more detailed casework, um, are really happy to um, support and refer you to any of the organisations who've spoken today. Um, we know people have a busy life as carers as well and can get a bit overwhelmed. So again, just contact us. Particularly as well, um, I've got quite a few families I've worked with um, making referrals to the Citizen Advice Bureau who, um, where English isn't their first language. Um, and even when it is, some of these things can be really quite difficult to understand. So. Um, I've attended, and I'm happy to do this, uh, meetings with them, for example, at the Citizen, Citizen Advice Bureau, um, and I'm happy to um, help fill in forms, as I said before. Um, we have worked with the uh, one of the specialist advisors, actually, Karen, that you mentioned, 
she was absolutely fantastic. So um, as well as referring people to welfare support uh, at Merton, who do, who do a great job, we do also refer um, to your specialist caseworkers and general advisors um, quite regularly. Um, just to say, we've got a new Merton um, Mencap Impulse Bulletin that Tahina works hard on. And that also um, has sections on tips on money saving as well. Um, things like warm spaces, um, which we heard about warm and welcome, warm and welcome, or warm Wednesdays, sorry, um, from Jude King, but um, which is one of these fantastic warm spaces um, that are popping up all over the country. There are 4,000 across the UK now and they're growing. So we try and um, talk about these sorts of things that are going on locally and changes that are happening in the borough. So do look out. You can put in, I think, your postcode and see what warm spaces are around you. So you can pop out, save a bit of money and turn, turn the heating off uh, now and again. Um, going on to Carers Support Merton, who we also work closely with, they're another fantastic organisation. Um, they have a whole section on their website offering financial support for carers and um, do, do have a look at that if you can. Um, and um, Karen talked a lot about the excellent services that, that um, are on offer um, at the moment for cost of living um, problems. But as we said before, Carer Support Merton do have a, um, a, a service at the Vestry Hall um, it's really important that there is strict criteria for that project, though, and um, the carer has to be um, involved um, through a carer's assessment or have some current strong support from um, Carer Support Merton currently. So they have to be registered and be working with them, usually through a carer's assessment um, in the last year to be eligible for that service but it's every Thursday at the Vestry Hall and they give um, specialist advice there too, as well as reaching out, as we heard, to libraries um, and through their mainstream services in Morden and Mitchin. Um, so there's a lot of support. As I said before, if you hate uh, digital links, et cetera, Yvonne and I can help you navigate that. Um, we know people with a disability have incurred, incur a lot of extra costs as well. Um, so, you know, um, one of the things I wanted to say as well, which came out in a recent meeting with the council, is that for those of you who care for somebody who receives support from adult social care, Merton Council have announced that individuals who are seeing their disability costs rising as a result of the cost of living crisis and can evidence this, can request a, a complete reassessment of their financial contribution. And this may result in an increase in disability related expendi expenditure and more money in your pocket. So um, I don't have lots and lots of information on that, but I can refer you to the right department. And it's always worth looking at that as costs increase. So there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of help out there. I'm going to be brief because you've had a lot of information to take in. Um, there's our contact details there. I should mention quickly that um, as well, as well as Yvonne who does carers assessments and myself who works um, on casework with individual carers and families, um, we have um, Dimfna Graham, our community facilitator, um, who supports adults with learning disabilities, um, stroke and or ASD, um, autism. So she can also direct um, you um, adults with learning disabilities to um, all of the uh, people who've spoken today and other agencies, for example, Merton Employment, to try and help uh, people's financial situations. Um, and her, her details are on here too. So thank you very much to all the speakers and um, thanks for listening to me. And uh, I look forward to working with you. Some people I've seen are attending today, I'm already working with, which is great. Um, and thank you very much.